Okay, I hope the rest of the class uh, will be watching the video. Uh, anyway, um, any questions? Uh, today I'd like to move to uh, magnetic field boundary conditions. Let me just reduce the volume a little bit. Magnetic field boundary conditions. Let me remind you that uh, what boundary conditions mean. Uh, so boundary conditions both, both for the electric and the magnetic field determine how the electric and the magnetic field changes uh, across the interface between two media. So boundary conditions determine how electric and magnetic fields change. So electric field, uh, electric flux density, magnetic flux density, magnetic field intensity change across the interface between two media. To review what we had seen in electrostatics, and uh, that is quite relevant because there is duality between the electrostatic and the magnetostatic concepts, let me, me remind you what we did then. So in electrostatics, the question that we had was what happens when we have an interface between a dielectric with dielectric permittivity epsilon 1 and a dielectric with dielectric permittivity epsilon 2. So we have relative dielectric permittivities uh, epsilon r1 and epsilon r2. That interface doesn't have to be planar. However, boundary conditions are just like the boundary conditions you use in partial differential equations in mathematics. That is, they are point-wise conditions. So if I pick a point at the interface right here, and I focus around that point, so I exaggerate this area, I draw the local tangent, and now around this point I have basically a planar interface between these two media. And then I can define at this planar interface between epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 that extends along this local tangent to the point of interest, I can define a normal unit vector. I call this n hat. So I have here the region 1, region 2, and n hat points from region 1 to region 2. And then we asked, how does the electric field change from 1 to 2 right at the interface, as we go through the interface? To answer this question, so that is to find how E changes across the interface, we invoked the uh, fundamental uh, postulates of electrostatics. And we said, let's apply first Gauss's law at the interface. How can we do that? We, take, we took this uh, area around the point of interest where I want to uh, calculate the boundary condition, and we defined a cylinder, a very small cylinder, like this. So it has a top area, it has the sides, and then a bottom. And we said, let's apply Gauss's law there. Gauss's law says that if I take the closed surface integral, the flux of the electric flux of the electric field through uh, this cylinder. So S here is the cylinder that will be equal to the enclosed Q. Okay. So we have to calculate the flux and we have to calculate the enclosed charge. Uh, before we do that, we actually take the height of the cylinder to go to zero. Why do we do this? Precisely because we are trying to extract a boundary condition. So a cylinder that is very long would not do because it would correlate fields that are very far away from the interface. Whereas I want to go as close to the interface as possible. That's what this mathematical limit expresses. It expresses 
something very physical. That I want to correlate fields that are really close to the interface, left and right, not very far from the interface. So that's why I take this limit h going to zero. So the first part of this calculation is to find the flux. So there will be flux through the top. Remember the local normal uh, at the interface, I called it n hat. So here on this uh, face, on the top, ds will be n hat ds. So it will be point in the direction of n hat. I need to find that flux. I need to find the flux through the bottom. In this case, for the uh, bottom face, ds, now you remember those uh, flux uh, integrals. When we have this ds in Gauss's law, always points outwards from the surface that you consider. Okay, so at the bottom, it will be not pointing in the direction of n hat. It will be pointing in the direction of minus n hat. So now this is minus n hat ds. And then I have the flux through the sides which, however, will go to zero because I'm letting uh, the side surface go to zero. So basically here, the flux through the cylinder now that is not an open, this flux through the side, d dot ds, that goes to zero, not because the electric field goes to zero, but because this area through which I'm calculating the flux, I'm letting it go to zero. So basically, with this mathematical limit, I have flux only from the top and the bottom. And hence, when I calculate the left-hand side here, and again, I'm reviewing these concepts because they are really very relevant to how, what we will see in uh, magnetostatics. So I have the flux through the top, I have the flux through the bottom, and I have the flux through the side. Uh, the one through the side will go to zero as h goes to zero. And then the one through the top will be if uh, the area here is A, and the area here is A as well, the top and the bottom. The cylinder is, uh, has uniform cross-section of area A. Okay. So then the flux through the top will be N ds. Uh, the flux through the bottom will be minus NDS. You see that the top is in region 2. So I call this flux, this electric flux density D2. I call this electric flux density D1 because the bottom is in the first medium. So now uh, taking this area small enough, I can consider that the field, because I'm interested in this area just around the point, right? So in that area, the electric field is basically equal to the field at that point. And hence, this flux integral is equal to n hat d2 times the area, A. And this one is equal to minus n hat d1 times the area. So I have out of this n hat d2 minus d1 times the area A of the cylinder. So this is now the dot product projects the total D into, onto the n hat unit vector. So this is n dot d2. It is the normal component of the electric flux density to the interface. So this is the component that is being sampled by applying Gauss's law. And if I have, uh, let's say, so this is d, sorry, this is d1. 
And if I have D2 like this, this is the n hat D2. It is the component of um, the electric flux density that points normal to the interface, the one that pokes the interface. Normal components poke the interface, tangential components flow along the interface, skip the interface. So this is the first, uh, the left-hand side, D2n minus D1n normal times A. The right-hand side is the enclosed Q. Now, as I am shrinking the cylinder to the interface, the only case that I may enclose charge is which one? Anybody remembers from electrostatics? So Q enclosed. So I'm uh, shrinking the cylinder to the interface. So the only case that I enclose charge is which one? Is if there is surface charge on the interface. That's the only one. So I can have enclosed charge only if there is some surface charge density, rho sub s, at the interface. In that case, the Q enclosed will be rho sub s times the area A. Again, I'm not, I don't need to define rho sub s as a function of x, y, z because I'm deriving conditions that hold at one point at the interface. So that point is where you evaluate rho sub s and all those fields. So now if you let the left-hand side be equal to the right-hand side, we get this first condition, D2n, is equal to, uh, sorry, minus D1n, is equal to rho sub s. One of the conditions that we also asked for in, the, in uh, your midterm. And uh, that tells you that the electric flux density can only be discontinuous across an interface if there is surface charge density. And therefore, if this is an interface between two pure dielectrics, the rho sub s will be zero because rho sub s is free surface charge density. If you don't have free charges in dielectrics, there are no free charges. All charges are bound to their nuclei. Then also there won't be any charge density either. So for a dielectric dielectric interface, so interface between two insulators, rho sub s will be zero and this condition becomes a condition of continuity that D1n is equal to D2n. So if we replicate now this uh, uh, process for magnetostatics, so now I stop here, I won't go to the second condition in electrostatics, and I will switch to magnetostatics for Gauss's law. So in magnetostatics, Gauss's law says that the closed uh, path, so the closed uh, surface integral, sorry, of uh, the magnetic flux density is equal to zero. So the magnetic flux lines, the interpretation of this is the magnetic flux lines are always closed that we cannot identify for magnetism any counterpart of the electric charge and reflects our inability over the years to isolate magnetic monopoles. So we cannot have, we don't have any counterpart of the electric charge in magnetism, at least so far. We have not been able to isolate magnetic monopoles. When we have magnets, they come in pairs of north and south pole. Even if you break a magnet, you won't be able to isolate the north and the south pole. You will generate two new magnets with a north and a south pole. So this is now the law. Now look at this process. 
that we applied for the same law in electrostatics. Think about what would happen if we replaced D with B, the electric flux density with the magnetic flux density. And now the only thing that changes is that I don't have to worry about the right-hand side because the right-hand side is zero. So if we apply the same process, we end up with the condition that n hat that b2 minus b1 is zero. So now we have that the normal components at the interface between of the magnetic flux density are unconditionally continuous. So whereas in electrostatics, the electric flux density is only continuous if I don't have charge on the surface, in magnetostatics, the magnetic flux is always continuous normally to the interface. And um, One practical situation where this condition uh, has a significant impact if is whenever you consider a conductor inside the magnetic field, a perfect conductor, a superconductor for that matter, inside a magnetic field. So, Before I give you, uh, before I continue to the second condition, let me do an example for this one. Superconductor or perfect conductor. So perfect conductors are media with uh, conductivity that goes to infinity, very high. So let's say we have a superconductor inside a uniform magnetic field. So for example, I have, uh, let's say, the magnetic field from uh, a magnet like this. As you remember, the uh, magnetic flux lines go from the North Pole to the South Pole of the magnet. And I bring in a cylindrical conductor like this. Superconductor. Conductors exhibit we said yesterday, perfect diamagnetism. So the magnetic susceptibility is equal to minus one, which means that the relative magnetic permeability, which is one plus xm, is equal to zero. That means that there is no magnetic flux density inside a conductor. So inside the conductor, magnetic flux density is equal to zero. So what happens then if I put the conductor inside this uniform magnetic field? Let's uh, try to see what does this condition imply here. So I will exaggerate the magnet a little bit so that we can see it. The conductor is right here. Okay. So a magnetic flux line that comes like this onto the conductor to impinge normally will be now subject to this boundary condition, which says that the normal component, this is the normal component, impinges at 90 degrees onto the interface, will have to be continuous across the interface. Okay? But on this side, I know that B2N is equal to zero. That means that this normal component will also have to be equal to zero. 
Now imagine another flux line that comes like this. Okay, imagine this flux line that impinges like this. You can now, because the magnetic flux you see outside the conductor impinges like this. You can analyze it into a tangential component and a normal component. This is the tangential component. This is uh, the tangent, let's say, to the surface is this. So this is the tangential component. And this one is the normal component. Well, guess what? The normal component has to remain continuous across the interface. So if I apply the boundary condition, B1N has to be equal to B2N, which happens to be 0 again. So that means that this also has to be zero. So the continuity of the normal magnetic flux tells me that there can be no normal components of the magnetic flux on the conductor. And what does this mean overall? It means that the magnetic flux lines will be deformed to wrap around the conductor. They, have, they are allowed to only have tangential components around the conductor. So, Overall, this means that the magnetic flux lines, maybe I will leave this diagram on and to remind you this argument about how boundary conditions are applied. So overall, what happens is that when I bring in this conductor, this perfect conductor or superconductor, if you wish, the magnetic flux lines will be deformed so they wrap around the conductor. So the continuity of these normal components combined with the fact that inside the conductor I cannot have magnetic flux density means that right outside the conductor the magnetic flux is not allowed to have normal components and therefore it has to wrap around. Compare this picture to what we saw in electrostatics. So what would happen if I had put this inside, let's say, a capacitor? So I have a capacitor here with an electric field that goes from the left to the right. Anybody remembers what happens to this electric field if you bring in now a, a, a conductor, a, a wire? So let me just uh, put here again. The So let's say I bring in a, the same conductor, the same wire. Now I'm putting it inside an electric field. What happens? Anybody remembers? So the conductor is an equipotential surface. So an equipotential surface, electric field lines impinge normally and uh, this will be the deformation of the electric field. Okay, so that will be the deformation of the electric field. Okay, so compare the two pictures about electric uh, field lines and magnetic field lines uh, and the difference, right? So here the uh, electric field lines sink onto the conductor. That means that there is a surface charge density negative on this side of the conductor, positive on this side of the conductor. We had, I had drawn this picture just like yesterday. Okay, so this is uh, the, fir the first uh, boundary condition for 
the magnetic field. Any questions so far? Okay. Uh, so now I go to the second boundary condition. I, I will follow exactly the same um, exactly the same methodology. That is, I will remind you what we did in electrostatics, and then I will try to apply the same principles in magnetostatics. I think review is never useless. Uh, so the second fundamental postulate in electrostatics law is that the electric field along a closed path, the electric field integral along a closed path is zero. The physical meaning of this is that the electric field is conservative. The electric force is conservative because if you imagine a charge Q multiplying this expression, that means that the work of a force of the electric field of the Coulomb force along a closed path is zero. That is the trademark of conservative fields. It uh, also holds for gravity. Gravitational fields are also conservative. If you push the chalk up at some height and then uh, I let it uh, fall back, then I'm producing overall zero uh, work. So same thing holds for the electric field. We use this condition to understand how tangential electric field components to the interface change. So we took the same situation, that is the interface around the point of interest, and we applied this law. So again, we have the same interface as that one. And now instead of applying Gauss's law, I apply this second uh, fundamental postulate. And again, I do this integral over some length here, delta L and a height h. So if I do this, e dot dl along this closed path has to be equal to 0. So let me take it uh, step by step. Let's say I have uh, an electric field E2 on this side, E1 on this side, that means the electric field E1 will have a component, sorry E2 will have a component that is normal to the interface and one that is tangential to the interface I call, is, I call this E2T. And same thing with E1. One component normal to the interface that pokes the interface and one that is parallel to the interface. And I call this E1t. And now I do this integration. From A to B, from B to C, from C to D, and then from D to A. So this height is H. I let it go to 0. My closed path integral then will be integral from A to B, E dot DL, plus integral from B to C, plus C to D, plus D to A, E dot DL. But now I let again H go to 0. And that means that the integral A to D will go to 0, and the integral from B to C will go to 0, because they correspond to these two paths.
So we can agree that as I shrink this segment to zero, those integrals will go to zero. And that leaves me with only a to b and d to c. a to b, you see, is along the direction of this component. And it is normal to this component. So therefore, the a to b part is basically equal to the tangential component of the field on the second side times the length, delta L. Along DC, you see I'm moving opposite to the direction of the tangential electric field on the first side. So that will give me minus E1, T, delta L. So that gives me E2, T minus E1, T, delta L. That is equal to zero, the law tells me. And hence, we have the second condition, which is the continuity of tangential electric fields across an interface. So this is similar to the continuity of the magnetic flux because it is unconditional. No matter what, if you have a resistor and you measure the voltage to the left or to the right, you will find exactly the same thing. The tangential electric field that gives rise to the voltage remains continuous across this interface, which you don't appreciate as a very important interface, but it is an interface between air, the medium of the resistor, so it is a material interface that involves actually two sides uh, and uh, two media. So tangential electric field components across interfaces are unconditionally continuous. In fact, it is this condition that gives rise to this picture because now we cannot have the inside the conductor, the electric field is zero. So therefore, the electric field now cannot have tangential components on the conductor because the continuity says that those components have to be zero because on the other side, the electric field is zero. So therefore, we have now the dual picture. In the magnetic field case, the magnetic flux cannot have tangential components. In the electric case, the electric field cannot have, uh, sorry, cannot have normal components. The magnetic flux cannot have normal components. The electric field cannot have tangential components. So this is uh, what we had in uh, electrostatics. In magnetostatics, though, the corresponding law to this one is the Ampere law. So Ampere law says that the closed path integral of the magnetic field intensity is actually equal to the enclosed current. To the enclosed current. And now you see that there is in fact a possibility that when I apply this law close to the interface, so I repeat the same procedure, Again, on the two sides of the interface, I'll be sampling tangential components of the magnetic field intensity. But now, there is the possibility that I enclose a current as I'm shrinking this, uh, this path, the height of this path. When would I enclose a current? Yes. That's right, if there is a surface current density. So you see the duality between the electric and the magnetic cases. In previous case with the electric field, with Gauss's law, 
as we were shrinking the cylinder, the only case that we would enclose a charge would be if there is charge on the surface. Here, if there is current right on the surface. And uh, just to avoid any uh, issues with the sign, let's let there be a current density J sub S that goes this way. So in this way, the enclosed current would be J sub S at the interface times delta L. Remember that uh, the current that is produced by a surface charge density is equal to the density times the width of the front through which the current flows. And hence, this will be the enclosed current. So then my left-hand side would be H2 tangential minus H1 tangential times delta L. And the right-hand side will be JS times delta L. So that means that I have H2 tangential minus H1 tangential can be discontinuous if there is a surface current density. And likewise, with the electric case, if there is no surface current density, they will be continuous as well. So that is... Um, now, as you saw, I had to think about the direction of the current just to be consistent with the signs that are involved in the assumptions of Ampere's law. The, a, a rigorous way to write this same condition without having to worry about signs is this one. N hat cross H2 minus H1 is equal to J sub S. So this is actually a condition that is equivalent and you don't have to worry about which way does the current flow. So I have here a cross product, not a dot product like in Gauss's law, a cross product. So you see the electric and the magnetic cases uh, have similarities and some differences, some duality, I would say, uh, between the two cases. So to give you an example of such a case where there is a current, Here is an example. Uh, remember the uh, surface charge, the surface current density on the xy plane that we solved with Ampere's law. So we saw this example. You can uh, see it back in your notes. We solved it actually both with Ampere's law and with the Biot-Savart law. an infinite current density on the xy plane. So a very um, convenient representation of a current density whenever you have problems with current density is from the point of view that the current flows towards you. So if I go from the point of view of the y-axis, and I draw the xz plane like this so that the y-axis comes out of the board, then you see I have the current coming towards me. That is a very convenient representation of surface current densities. We found the, the magnetic field that is being produced by this uh, uh, surface current density. So we found that the magnetic field intensity is equal to x hat j s naught for 
z greater than uh, zero, and uh, and uh, minus x uh, hat j s naught for Uh, sorry, over 2, of course, over 2, and over 2, for z greater than 0 and z less than 0. So this is what we found, uh, and we solved this problem twice with uh, the Biosavar law and with Amper's law. So you can refer to your notes for this um, uh, solution. So I just wanted to use this example to confirm this boundary condition and show you how it would work as an example. So in this case, what I call n hat is a normal vector. That, so this is region 1. It's a z less than 0. This is region 2. In fact, here it so happens that the two media are the same. There is no difference in the media. There is just a surface current density that separates the two. So the normal unit vector that points from region 1 to region 2 is which one? Anybody can guess what is this normal unit vector? Unit vector along the z-axis. Unit vector along the z-axis? The z-hat, yes. OK? So then this boundary condition would say what? It would say that z hat cross product magnetic field at z equal 0 plus. So you see here what the mathematicians say, x plus, x minus. It means that I am right at the interface, but a little bit on the, on the top side. And then uh, I have h at z equal 0 minus as the h1, and that should be equal to j sub s. So if I put in the expressions that I had found, z cross not over 2, the surface current density is y j s naught. OK? Z cross X is Y. J S not over 2 plus J S not over 2 is J S not. And you see that we have indeed the confirmation of this boundary condition. So that is how it works. You find the normal unit vector that points from the first region to the second region. You collect the expressions of the magnetic field in the two regions. You put them in. And on the right-hand side, you have the surface current density. So this is a simple case uh, where this is confirmed. But there is also, uh, I'd like to just uh, close the lecture with a very practical uh, case where both of these boundary conditions are important. And. Um, And the application really that comes to mind is the one of electromagnets and magnetic cores. So a typical structure that is uh, being used for many applications, for example, to lift uh, uh, very heavy objects with an electromagnet, is when you have a coil, like a solenoid like this, a solenoid, that produces here a magnetic flux. And you want two things. To access the magnetic flux, so 
you, you, you want to, uh, for example, create a magnetic field that is very strong so that it applies a strong force to lift an object. So you want to concentrate this magnetic flux and like we use wires for electricity, guide the magnetic flux somewhere far from the solenoid. Because I have the solenoid here and I want to lift an object that is over there. I don't want to bring the solenoid always to the object. I want to guide it towards the object. So this is exactly what these materials are supposed to do. They are supposed to guide this flux like wires to the gap where you can have the object where you want to apply this magnetic flux. We are using for such cores high mu materials. So materials with magnetic permeability that is very, very high. Why do we do this? There are two, uh, there are two reasons. First of all, if you have the, uh, the interface between a material that is, let's say, ferromagnetic. We saw yesterday for ferromagnetic materials that the magnetic permeability is in the hundreds of thousands. So let's say that we take one such material and above we have air. So let's say I take an electromagnet and I generate a magnetic flux inside this material. So I have this magnetic flux in the core. So you see this magnetic flux runs tangentially to the interface. So this magnetic flux is mu naught mu r h in the core. So you see this now is going tangentially to the interface. You see this is the interface. Here is the material of the core. And this is air. So I'm looking at an interface like uh, this one here. Okay? So I have the material, I have the flux lines that run parallel to the interface and I'm looking above. So I don't have any current on this interface, right? So if you are here, if you are here, if you are here, there is no current. The currents I created with the wires. There is, there is nowhere else, okay? Nowhere else there are currents. So then the boundary condition here tells me that if this is region one and this is region two, H2 comma T will be equal to H1 comma T because there is no current. The current is here, there is no current here, there is no current here, no current here, nowhere else in the core. Which means that B2 tangential divided by the mu of the air, which is mu naught, will be equal to B1 tangential mu naught mu r. Okay. So that means now that the magnetic flux in the air you see because, I, because this uh, magnetic flux has no normal component the outside flux will not have a normal component either. That is by the continuity of normal components. Okay, so the entire fluxes, both inside and outside, are tangential altogether. So the magnetic flux then in the air will be equal to the magnetic flux in the core divided by mu sub r from this condition. And as mu sub r goes to infinity, this will actually go to zero which means that such materials are being used precisely because they can concentrate the flux in their interior and they act like wires. If you think about it, this is the same trick that wires like this do. They are made of high conductivity materials. The current flows inside 
and doesn't leak outside. Why? Because this is where the conductivity is. Outside, in air, there is no conductivity. And therefore, the current doesn't go anywhere. It stays within the conductor. So same thing with those magnetic core materials. And as a result, instead of having the solenoid in air, which would be a disaster because, as we saw, the magnetic field of the solenoid has magnetic flux lines like this. So you have the solenoid and the solenoid spreads out the magnetic flux everywhere. Instead of doing that, you put it in the core and then the core basically guides the magnetic flux, concentrates the magnetic flux inside it. And now I have an object here that I want to lift. The magnetic flux comes in here, normally to this interface, and because now at that interface it's normal, it will remain continuous. So the high magnetic flux that comes in in the core will appear in the gap. And that's why you can have an electromagnet where we are generating the magnetic flux here. It's guided and then you have a small gap. And then at that gap you can access the high magnetic flux of the core because now the gap is hitting the... Uh, because the magnetic flux hits the gap now at 90 degrees. So along the core you have at play the second boundary condition and at this gap you have at play the first boundary condition and you can access this high magnetic flux. So I'm stopping here. Thanks for your attention and we'll see you next week.